I'd like to get started. The subject today is when is democracy? And what do people take it for that they so urgently want it? In the dictionary, this, the rule by the people, is what you find in every dictionary. In some dictionaries, you also find the second definition along with it, where there's a tendency to equality. Some of the suggestions of what equality might mean, because the word alone means nothing, is equality before the law, equality of rights, equality of opportunity, equality of education. You can be thinking each time in which countries, the one you live in or other countries, you feel this takes place. The difference between a democracy in the legal sense of the word and a republic is that democracy is actually originally what now is called participatory democracy, and that is direct rule by the people. Whereas a republic is where the people elect a representative. Now, there are many other words and notions that we've come to associate with democracy. Things like a writ of habeas corpus. Does everybody know what that is? No. The writ of habeas, does anybody know what that is? <laughs> really? A person has a right not just to disappear, <laughs> but that it has to be acknowledged that the person is taken. He has a right to representation. And he is considered innocent until proven guilty. It's all in there somewhere. You will find, although that we've come treasure that, and I must say, I treasure it as one of the most important rights, however little <laughs> it may exist. It is not in all countries that call themselves democracy. There are many countries in the world that call themselves democracies that do not have that. So it belongs to a particular legal system that exists mainly in Anglo-Saxon countries and not in all countries that call themselves democracies. Also, for instance, we associate no censorship with democracy. Again, these are separate things that have been fought for in certain democratic countries that have enough money to allow themselves no censorship. There are certain rights and privileges that can be given in advanced industrial societies because those societies have enough money to counterbalance any knowledge that is acquired by citizens and any propaganda. Direct propaganda and indirect propaganda through films, through clothes, through all kinds of comforts and joys that people want so much that they're willing to give up their participation in making the decisions that rule them in exchange for having nice looking things. Cars, nice houses, frilly curtains. All of these things are seducers away from making decisions that rule your life. They don't belong to democracy, but they allow people to think they choose where actually they only select. They select a number of things that make no difference to the people who rule. The people who rule want you to buy, but what you buy doesn't make any difference to them at all. The number of people probably make the decisions in every country that call itself, calls itself democratic today is probably not terribly different 
than the number of people in a dictatorship. It is the means by which they do it that is different. Democracy has become the buzzword of the 90s. Uh, it's interesting that if you read about third world countries, where there used to be the word development as a cover up for exploitation, there is now the word democracy. It seems to have such a pleasant ring for everybody. Capitalism is an economic system that is presently supposed to accompany democracy in most countries. Capitalism is when the value of what the producer produces, you can always put worker for producer, minus her or his wages, belongs to the owner of the means of production. That is where he gets his money from. I mean, it's then inherited and all those things. Constant money coming in the capitalist class, as it's called. And that's called the rate of exploitation. If I work for, for 10 hours or 8 hours and produce um, products, radios, whatever, that are worth $400 and for that time I am paid $200 or $100, then the other $300 go to the owner of the means of production. And that's what we call surplus value, and it is the basis of capitalism. One more point I want to make because there's much confusion about that, and that is there is a big difference between economics and finance, and they also should not be confused. There's also People always say, money is the root of all evil. The money that we have in hand, those few dollar bills, don't make any difference. They are just, um, they're just tokens. And whether they exist or don't exist doesn't make any difference, and getting rid of them is not going to change anything. Finance is something else, and usury is something else. And if I have no money and I'm sitting somewhere where people are starving and I have a cellar full of potatoes and I give somebody 20 potatoes on the condition that when he, it comes about he has to give me back 30 potatoes, then I become a potato shark. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a matter of money, it's a matter of scarcity. And as long as we have scarcity, will have usury. As long as we have scarcity, we'll have usury. And not as long as we have money. Okay, what's usury? Usury is lending somebody something and getting more back than you lent. Where money is more convenient is it doesn't rot like a potato. Nor do diamonds, nor does wood. There are lots of things that don't rot. But to have it in a symbolic form, which doesn't, re doesn't really have any value at all. Because there's nothing you can do with money. You can't eat it, you can't live in it. You can burn it. You can burn it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only, a, it, it's only a belief. Because we believe in it, it functions. So you're saying that those people who think well, if we just got rid of money, everything would be much better. You're saying that behind the money is the principle of usury. Yes, it's people. the principle of scarcity. What resources, if we think about it now, what resources are missing for most of us? Money. It is a resource of society because it does do that purchasing for us, and we don't have enough. That doesn't mean there isn't enough money in the world, but it's a resource that we don't have enough of. Whereas there's a problem in, in high finance that there's too much money.
said as long as there's scarcity, there'll be usury. Mm -hmm. Can it also be the other way around? As long as there's usury, there'll be scarcity. I don't quite want to turn it around. It certainly doesn't help get rid of scarcity, but I think it's more important that there be an analysis uh, of what actually is there and how the language about it functions. That would help more than, because I think one could take the power away from usury if people realized that it's there. language still speaks of scarcity where it doesn't exist, people will make use of it. The language about it, the way we speak about it, has yeah. to change before anything else can change. And, the way the and then I think the two are interlocking and will leave us if they leave at all at the, at the same time. Right, and I think that what Jeff said changes, yeah. changes the language that we use because it implies that scarcity is something that is that exists for a reason and is made often. But it makes it look as if it, the reason is usury and it's not. Mm -hmm. Ties into the separation presentation. Yes. This is the cause. Yes. Well, we see the connectedness of it. That's what I'd also say with that. It's the connectedness and not one before the other or one after the other. It's the circularity of it. Uh, and wherever you point, it's the wrong place. <laughs> when you take when it around, uh, scarcity is another thing. It's a tool. In the original version, it is the situation. And you think that usurers and usurers mm -hmm. can generate artificial scarce, scarcity? Yes. That's what cornering the market is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's what he refers to. And Jeff did not say it. He only thought it. Related to all this is what we call the markets, and, uh, the stock markets and other markets where you actually invest something and the money you have, the value you have, increases without any production. Um, that's a major problem in economics at the moment, is that people are investing more and more in the things that really have no value, that are just bonds, and um, one doesn't yet know, everybody expects things to explode, but they keep going, <laughs> we don't know how long they'll go. Uh, but it certainly has a lot to do with the fact that there are so many unemployed, because money isn't being put where there's a production and where there's going to be employment. So this is the whole realm of finance. Uh, where the danger lies. And if in a society that we build up, we have little coupons that are useful for exchange purposes, I don't know if they'll be needed or not, but that is not the point. And I find it always, if people point at a dollar bill and say, no, you just got to get rid of that. There's a mysticism in that. Do you have any problem with sharing this information? I have no problems. If somebody jumps on me and says, this is too simplistic, then you have to say yes. <laughs> it is. But it gives some kind of general notion about something that I think causes a lot of confusion. And unless I spend a lot more time. Yes? When did it begin? to sound when one uses the word economics, that if it means least expenses, that is saving, administrating a given budget, be, you have to be economical about it. And you have to economize. You have to cut your belt. Cut, uh, you, you have, I don't know. Was, Does anybody know that? I don't and now we have the climax. They say, come to Bergners and save. What? 
the advertisements don't read anymore. There is a sale and come buy something. They say, come to burglars, which is it. Ah, yes. So, and I say, understood burglars, excuse no. me. I <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not at any distance. No, no, we don't. <laughs> there, there are burglars without entering the breaking. Right? Yes. <laughs> no, but that is that the word save is accepted. You do not find the word buy anymore in public advertisements. That's true. Whatever you do, you save. If you stay home, you're the loser. Yeah. Yes. Right. You couldn't save. But that is called that is called in some level of discourse. Yes. And yes. Then you, and without malign, mal mal without bad mm -hmm. To economize, economics, bad economics, cost, cost, what is it? cost efficiency, cost efficiency, Sorry, efficiency, yes. Uh, in terms of cost, everything is uh -huh. called economics. I understand that, but to use the daily use is sometimes sort of kitchen kids in church. Right? Yeah, I don't know when, when that came or which came even first. So. I want to know that there's act together this effect in, just to contact with some loud voices around here, which I respect, whether this is a result of that even within the family, the budget was allocated and the wife was asked, take care of the household, but be economical about it. Don't waste. I bought, you know, I just recently bought a home for you. Why should I buy it? All this is considered to be thinking economically. What can one do about that? Can one weed it out? Just as successfully as we weeded out all the other words we'd like to. So this, the <laughs> method is not, by you, not uh, contemptuously looked at? Not method. at all. Uh, Among other I things, words also at, are... Not contemptuously. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, this is, this, this is wonderful because it allows me to see the words once naked. Um, that was it, and if anybody wants any more embellishment put on them, I'm willing. It isn't my purpose. Street lights, highways, streets. It was considered for a while that you put street lights up where beyond my house, and it's paid by taxes. That's socialism. There was an uproar in this country about things like that. Building streets for other people and not taking toll for it? Pure socialism, a library. It's all socialist. One always thinks of socialized medicine. Uh, what does it mean? It actually just means for the benefit of society instead of for the benefit of the industry and the doctors. So it depends on for whose benefit the medical system, the healthcare system is functioning. I once had this experience that my neighbor's pipes had frozen, and I didn't, and some there was water pounding, and I didn't know who to call, so I called the firemen, they came up with the fire truck. With their those costumes they wear are wonderful, you know, boom, 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 boom. They got in the apartment, they fixed it, and I thought I had to pay them. So I took my checkbook out and asked them, how much do I need to pay you? Because they had done a wonderful job. They, and they laughed because it was a public service. service. They said, man, we don't need your money. We're, this is what the city pays for. I already gave you. I already gave you the yeah. <laughs> And in that same way, when I had an accident in East Germany and I was taken to the... And when I left, I wanted to pay. And they laughed at me. And I said, but I don't come from here. I don't want to take your resources. And they said, they can't open a whole financial system just for me. <laughs> there never is or has been yet any economic system. The system comes about through the look that political economy takes because the economics just has this narrow look that I spoke about. From the political aspect of it, the components come together to form something that we can look at as a system. Stalin actually got us into the mess by announcing that communism had been reached at the point when it was an entirely totalitarian system. What is that? What's a totalitarian system? Just remind us. Can you answer your question? 
system. I guess the totalitarian system is where the maintenance of the public government is the most important thing rather than the needs of the members being considered the most important thing. The individual happiness of the people is the least important thing. Mm -hmm. And where the hierarchy is, to is retained totally, I would say, and the power is at the peak. Communism was considered a power structure in which everything is dictated from the top and in which not even the needs of the people were met because the country was too poor and supposedly it was the system that made it poor. It was never inspected that the fact that it, it never had a chance, it couldn't become poor because it started poor. Uh, it's very difficult, I may add, for a country to become rich now because our richness is based on stealing, exploiting, taking the resources from the third world. Um, people who now would like to become rich, new countries that form, have a great difficulty because there's not that much left to exploit. And there you do have, with all excuse, some good function in, in media that looks at me. Um, it is seen now a little bit by people, at least who can look, uh, the connection between somebody gaining wealth and it being grabbed from somewhere. Yes? There's a topic that I'm curious about in relation to this, and I don't know how to ask a question about it. Um, it has to do with illegal economies, or what are sometimes called black markets, yes. et cetera, that are, exist in this country, and it existed in the socialist countries, yes. and were talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you would speak about that in terms of the conditions <coughs> you have. Yeah. Um, by the way, I would say that these millionaires that have popped up in Soviet Union, in Russia now, or in the countries, are the result of what was going on. That is what I call the potato sharks, in every sense of the word, uh, who always waited until they could sell, not to the people who needed, but to the people who had a lot of money, um, or trade things. Um, there are whole books about this trade business that went on, how some people, through this mechanism, very cleverly built up a fortune for themselves, which now, when they can sell to the West, they can turn into dollars. It's no different, from I think, from any other economy, except that we don't even gain the taxes from it. And it, of course, takes jobs away. But since everything is actually undercover. <coughs> Even the so-called legal system right. has so much, so many aspects of a black market and of an undercover thing. It's very difficult to point at, that gets into so many political problems. The whole problems of immigration and being a legal person in the country. And what do you do if you're not a legal person? Can you do anything but be in an illegal system? This also is why we still have remnants of slavery. Feudal system anyway, but remnants of slavery. Case in Champaign-Urbana of a restaurant uh, where <coughs> illegal aliens were kept in one room and working in the kitchen of a restaurant um, and could not, never complain because they would be kicked out of the country and had absolutely no rights at all. So that goes on all the time. That's where you have the mixture of the systems. Most of the undercover systems are small replications of the major system. I think about this partially in <clears throat> relation to uh, something that was brought up by one of the design groups about, say, if a desirable system were brought about, what would prevent kind of backsliding into that kind of economy? Only if there's no scarcity. My only hope.
everything has to be visible. Uh, when the whole notion of what's now called intelligence, uh, which long since has had nothing to do with thinking, but only with discovering <laughs> secrets, <laughs> yes, discovering secret. If that has no function anymore, because there's nothing to hide, and you're welcome um, to all of these economic functions and interactions, um, people don't need to hide because they are secure. I, I mean, <laughs> the problem is immense to get there. But I see no hope as long as there's scarcity and people believe in the scarcity, fear the scarcity. And the language keeps undermining it for us. To me, this brings up to my mind mm -hmm. this whole thing of feeding the world countries mm -hmm. and what I'm expected by the system to do in relation to how many times do I get this in the mail? You know, these people are starving. Send us money. Yes. And the dilemma I face mm -hmm. in whether or not I'm going to choose to send that money mm -hmm. because I question the system that's sending the money. Right. It, that was the problem in, in South Africa where people said, if you boycott South Africa, you're harming the blacks. While the blacks were saying, boycott us. But again, one paid no attention to the people one was supposedly helping. What did we pay attention to? The media? Some of it. There was a lot. And the boycotts did make a difference. Yeah. Um, the description was made of just those charitable organizations, uh, which was, they are the proof of our success. The fact that we give charity and we are asked to give charity to these poor people is proof of the fact that we don't need it. We that, don't need what? That's what we give. We don't need the charity. But we need them to be We to need be them good. to be poor. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we need also to give charity so that they cannot become self-reliant. Because if they become self-reliant, they can become resistant to our taking their resources. And they could have the preposterous idea of keeping the oil for themselves. Which is really a criminal act, as our government has shown. Humans like, humans like you and me? Yes. <laughs> Maybe like them too? Because then if we have the situation, if we have separate nations, that people say, this is mine. The moment the United States and a few industrial countries know it's all theirs. But if that stops, then the wealth is already endangered for the rich countries. When we say we made the wealth, it, we conquered it. So maybe there is something to think locally and act locally. Right? <laughs> that was yesterday's shirt. Yeah, that was yesterday's shirt. <laughs> it looks 